Hello and welcome to another episode of Back to Britpop. It's me, Chris. On this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by Miles Hunt, a man that needs not much more of an introduction from me. Miles gives an amazing interview. He talks about everything across his career, from the Wonder Staff, musical influences, and what he's been up to during lockdown, and future plans for music, and all the other projects he's got going on at the moment. As per normal, I'll be back at the end of the interview to talk about all the ways that you can support the podcast. So stick around for that. But in the meantime, here's Miles. Welcome to the podcast, Miles Hunt. How are you? I'm all good, thank you. Yeah, no complaints. Nobody listens anymore. <laughs> uh, thanks for joining me. I appreciate it. Uh, it. It was your birthday a couple of days ago. Yeah, uh, Thursday. How how was it for you? Good, different experience this year, I'm guessing. Uh, no, it's exactly the same as last year. I just <laughs> went over to my friend Phil's, that's uh, the designer for the Wonder Stuff, and um, yeah, went over to his house. So, I, I yeah, there were two more friends there this year than there was last year. So, uh, oh, better than great. <laughs> yeah, a almost a, a party, you know. I mean, how's the last sort of twelve months been for you? Uh, I have to be careful when I answer this because my life, I, I, I was very fortunate. My life didn't change that much. Um, I live quite a solitary life out here in the uh, Shropshire countryside. Uh, there's just me and my dog in the house. Um, I actually prefer just being here. Um, if, I have to, if, if I ever have to leave, I leave in a bad mood. Uh, and then I have to work on myself wherever it is that I'm going. So um, I really the only big change for me was my local pub was closed for several months um, and the rest of it I just cracked on and I, I was very fortunate um, over a lot of my friends that are musicians and earn, earn their livings from touring um, in so much as I didn't have any gigs booked. Um, so I had kind of no loss of income I mean, I would have done gigs last year but I, sort of completely by accident certainly not by planning um, I toured with the Wonder Stuff in late 2019 so having done that I got enough uh, money to get through last year you've got some exciting stuff happening now you've got some gigs coming up acoustic gigs yeah I've, I've actually got some Wonder Stuff gigs first we we should have played at um, Mosley Folk Festival last year, but that got postponed to this year. And then there's two warm up shows um, before that: one in Cardiff and one in Homforth. Um, yeah, so I'm very much looking forward to seeing the gang and uh, getting in front of an audience. And then pretty much a month after that, I've got a couple of acoustic gigs. One. Um, in Shrewsbury, which is the nearest town to where I live, so I won't be in too much of a bad mood that day because I'm <laughs> going up the road. And then that's followed by an acoustic gig and a, a kind of Q and A thing with my old friend Gary Crowley um, in in Twickenham, I believe that is. So that's the second of October in Shrewsbury and the third of October in Twickenham. And how's that? Do you think going to feel getting on stage, especially with the full lineup? after so long uh it, you know, it'll just feel like getting on stage with the full lineup <laughs> i mean <laughs> I, I, i've been doing this so many years taking a year off was it won't make any difference to me you've been quite busy during lockdown with other projects as well so you've had the lockdown demo society was that something that you you wanted to do just to sort of keep things creatively moving yeah i just wanted to give myself a project really um I kind of had decided that I wasn't going to do any writing last year. So when we were in sort of January, February 2020, uh, it wasn't a year that I was going to sit down and do any writing. I was going to try a few other things just to occupy my time. Uh, I'd done quite a long period of writing, demoing, recording, and then touring the last Wonder Stuff album, um, which was all well worth it. You know, it was, it was, I enjoyed it all and it, and it paid off. You know, uh, the audience seemed to uh, have enjoyed the latest album that we did. Uh, but yeah, I was going to take a year off, but um, I started. I just started writing. I'm like, I can't sit around and do nothing. I mean, I'm very happy. My 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 kind of factory settings are bone idle, um, <laughs> so I'm I'm quite happy just to sit around uh, reading books, listening to music, watching the occasional movie, cooking. That that suits me fine. Um, 
but I started writing and then I was getting frustrating with my drum programming efforts and a dear old friend of mine Luke Johnson who's in a wonderful band called Low Lives that are based in in the US Luke lives out in uh, Phoenix Arizona but I've known Luke since he was five years old um, and he's an amazing drummer uh, he actually played drums on the fifth Wonder Stuff album Escape from Rubbish Island um, and we've done occasional gigs together um, but he was locked in at home you know with his family um, and said to me dude if you're uh, if, you, if you're writing anything let me do the drum programming for you so that was a great relief and then I didn't really know what I was writing for um, I certainly wasn't thinking of starting a new Wonder Stuff album so I thought you know what I could do I could see if because Pete Howard is now the drummer in the Wonder Stuff and Pete and I did Vent 414 together back in the mid 90s along with Morgan Nichols mm. And then I just guessed that Morgan would be, you know, not out doing his other job. He plays in Muse. Um, so I said to Morgan, you know, do you fancy swapping some bits of music around? So we, some of the songs that we did on the Bandcamp page uh, are earmarked for a future Vent 414 records. Um, and then Luke, um, who was programming the drums, he says, well, I've got a bunch of instrumentals that don't really suit the band that he's currently in, Low Lives, he said, do you fancy sticking your nasal wine on these and, <laughs> and, and seeing if you can find, yeah, you know, the songs in these instrumentals that he'd been working on for, there's like over 10 years worth. Of, I mean, there's, there's still another seven or eight of them sitting on my desktop for me to have a go at. So I don't know what will become of the songs that Luke and I have written. Uh, I don't know what he wants me. I don't know whether they would... Um, be suitable for a, a me solo album or a miles and luke album or whether he'd let me commandeer him for a wonder stuff album don't know um currently so i'm just carrying on in that vein i i, I was kind of slow with writing new material this year because i was concentrating on the streaming gigs that i did uh which were in place of a tour i would have done an acoustic tour i would have done um for my acoustic albums, The Custodian, of which I've done two of those now. So it's like 60 tracks I've re-recorded of Wonder Stuff songs, Vent songs, solo songs, couple of new songs, just me and the acoustic guitar. So I would have toured them either late last year or early this year. So instead I did four streaming shows from a lovely recording studio in Starbridge. Uh, it was a lovely three camera shoot and all the sound was nice, nice because I'd done a few Facebook live uh, Saturday afternoon sessions just to kind of cheer people up, really, mm. uh, and give myself something to work, work towards. Because even though it looks like, you know, you're doing an hour or 90 minutes uh, of just acoustic you know, noodling, um, it, it takes me a week to put those sets together. So it's given me something to do in the week. Um, so I did the the nice at home with the custodian ones from the studio in Starbridge. Did those in April and May this year, um, but it took a lot of time because it was. I think I had to learn like sixty, sixty five songs. But like <laughs> you know, at, at any point, at any point, I probably only know how to play between five or ten songs that I've written over the years. Okay, yeah. So you know, that are just there embedded in me. Um, so to to work out songs that i haven't played in some of them 30 years <laughs> was, wow yeah it, it, it was quite a lot of work but i thoroughly enjoyed it and the response from the audience was wonderful um but now that's over i i'm working on a book with a friend um which is proving uh really interesting to do and uh yeah i'm just ra writing random songs now so i don't usually do this i i usually go into a wonder stuff period of writing or a miles and erica period of writing or more recently just a my so I, I sort of know usually i know what kind of album i'm working on mm. so i mean it won't whatever it's going to be it won't appear till next summer but it's interesting at the moment because i just don't know what i'm writing for i'm just writing and as i say i don't usually do that but i'm in, thoroughly enjoying it uh with the writing aspects of things what are you drawing on now that's potentially different from when you first started to sort of produce and write albums is there is there been a sort of a change in terms of that that content um 
I consider what key I'm writing in more than I ever used to. You know, as well, particularly when I used to write primarily with Mark Treese, the guitarist in the Wonder Stuff. The way it used to work was mostly he would bring me guitar parts that he'd worked on um, that just sounded good to him, and I'd just start singing over them. Um, I mean, I, I still can sing all the old stuff, uh, but I know my speaking voice has dropped an octave. And it's it's not, a, you know, the last tour that the Wonder Stuff did, we were doing five new songs from Better Being Lucky, and then we were doing all of Eight Legged Groove Machine and all of Hop. And I think there was only one song that we changed the key to, and we didn't change the key to help my voice. It It was just... This song always sounded so thin on the record. Let's just drop it a tone, and and hopefully it will just sound a little bit more meaty. Um, so we don't generally change keys for me to find the singing of old songs more more easily. But I'm 55 now, and I guess this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Um, so when I write new songs, I do consider the key like you know, don't put this up in. I know B, uh, and then go for the top of my range. Uh, so I usually tune all my guitar. I su- so I suppose musically, I'm usually working in uh, dad gad, which is you know tuned down from regular tuning. I just I just hear more in the chord shapes. I hear just more musicality, I suppose, or or I'm just bored of your standard tuning. Um, and... it, it, it gives you a lot more room to sort of swoon and croon, doesn't it? Essentially, as well, and that might be something that is more appealing to sort of uh, yourself as, as you get. Yeah, it, it, I suppose I'm trying to force a development. I mean, I'm quite happy working in B and, and 160 beats per minute. Yeah. But, you know, I've done that. So now I do things like tuned down, working 80 beats per minute. And, yeah, so just just try and put a little bit more space in, into to what I'm writing and with the hope that if I am doing this in 10 years' time that my, my voice can handle, yeah. um, you know, uh, the, the, the more recent stuff that I write. So I, I look at it from that point of view. And then lyrically, I, it, has to, it has to come from how I'm feeling. I suppose my songs are all about how I'm feeling. Sometimes I mention why I'm in this mood, um, what's been going on in my life, um, why I'm going through various emotional things. Um, so I don't, I try to steer clear of what I would call lazy lyricism, which is, I think what I did, particularly on the fourth Wonder Stuff album, Construction for the Modern Idiot, there's there's just a lot of nonsense Um lyrically on those records because they're things that I don't really care about but the songs needed lyrics and actually at that point in my life I was very happy I was married I had a really nice flat in Camden we the wonder stuff built a great big studio that the cost of about 45 grand so I had absolutely nothing to whine and whinge about which is where I think I'm strongest lyrically is when I'm whining and whinging so that was a, so what I was doing then is I, I was reading books um, and taking feelings out of other people's artistic endeavours rather than my own. Mm. I just felt a bit at sea. In, um, so now I, I wouldn't dare do that again. I, I, it's, it's all me. Yeah. Um, and then little things like mentioning that we built an enormous studio. It was beautiful. We used to rent it out for uh, other artists to do videos and demos in. And whereas now I sit in what is essentially a spare bedroom with two computers couple of guitars and it's uh which which says to me you know you don't you don't need to be in very posh studios anymore to get a good song in fact in my experience that's kind of worked against me uh the more simple more neanderthal the uh the availability of equipment um actually i get better songs out of it and i and i also like today i've been sending parts of tracks to the Wonder Stuff's bass player um, Tim Saul. I've been sending parts to the Wonder Stuff guitarist Mark Gemini Thwaite, another guitarist that I want to work with that I used to work with years ago called Phil Hurley, who was in a band called Gigolo Arts. Mm. Um, been, and sending aspects of the track to Luke Johnson, who'll be doing some drum programming for me. So my demos end up sounding really good because I managed to pull in people with far more talent than me. You know yeah, yeah. In those early days of, of writing, then you just obviously mentioning how things are different for you now, but 
what was the pressure like for you to continue to write lyrics? Because um, you had an enormous amount of success. Yeah, well, I mean, the, I was I really wanted to try. I used to live, I used to share a flat with Clint Mansell in our early, it was the early days of Pop Will Eat Itself and, and the early days of the Wonder Stuff. And it always struck me that Clint Mansell was having far more fun on stage being the singer and and being the rhythm guitarist you know he, he could wear rock and roll clothes whereas I, I was a drummer at that time and you know you, you had to wear very sort of utilitarian clothing just just to play the drums because it's a more physical job and I'm like no I want to crimp my hair and wear a bit of makeup and wear a fancy shirt so I was like yeah no, I want to give a give a try to, to being a singer and then form this band with Mark Treese the wonder stuff um it was a different bass player it was pre the bass thing um but Martin Jilks um rest his soul um Malk had found as the drummer that he wanted to work with so Malk was just looking for a singer and I'm like give me a shot at it and then what hadn't occurred to me was ah oh, shit I gotta write the lyrics haven't I and so much of the eight-legged groove machine is just nonsense um I don't think you know, it's rhyming, it's rhythm. Um, I didn't have a great deal to get off my chest. It's, it, you know, it's gags. Um, it's not until I get to hop where I've actu actually had some life experiences. I mean, the eight-legged groove machine took us around the world. Uh, we met so many, you know, really inspiring, some really uninspiring um, people. You know, I was 21 years old and going around the world as a singer in a band. I was having experience, baby. Um, <laughs> yeah. so, so I stuck those into songs and, and that felt really comfortable uh, being able to do that on Hop Never Loved Elvis, a lot more of that you know, it was, it was a very uh, Miles-centric album Never Loved Elvis, uh, other than Welcome to the Cheap, Sheets, Cheap Seats I wrote not all of the music but I had the original idea for every song which, is, which was a switch because Prior to that, it had pretty much always been Malcolm Trees started the song by bringing a guitar part in, but Never Loved Elvis was all my ideas, and then everybody else in the band embellished them. Um, and then, yeah, then I got married and got happy, and uh, I don't like pretty... pretty I, I like On The Ropes, it was, but that was like the last song we wrote for the whole session out of about 25 songs. So I really like the lyrics to On The Ropes, but the rest of it's a lot of nonsense, to be honest. not very proud of that. Um, Were you ever had in mind that you wanted to sort of pursue collaborations as well, or was that something that just happened naturally? Um, it's something that's happened very naturally, um, I suppose. That's what me and Mount were doing from the beginning, and then when we paused the Wonder Stuff in the nineties, and I and I did Vent Four One Four with Pete Howard and Morgan Nichols, that was proper collaborating because really the sound of the band, the character of the band, was was those two. Mm. Um, it, it, it's such a phenomenal drummer, um, an extraordinary bass player, very, very unique sound that Morgan's got. So that was the character of the band, which inspired me to play completely differently. I definitely became a better electric guitarist during my period doing Vent 414. Um, and then after that, it was more co collaborations with friends in America, Michael Ferentino and uh, Andres Carew. From New Jersey, I, d I did a record with them called the Miles Hunt Club, um, and then getting into the 2000s, collaborating with Eric Knuckles. So, really, the guitars are just the background. Really, you know, it's they're just creating the bed for me to sing on and for Erica to play on. That that was a huge learning curve. So everything's happened really naturally. But I think it's only in the last two or three years I've decided now. Um, from working with Mark Gemini Thwaite, who's one of the guitarists in The Wonder Stuff, he's so capable of putting entire backing tracks together. And they're arranged with verses and choruses and middle sections and then alternative middle sections. And he sends me all these files. And I sit there and from the moment, he's done it to me again in the last month with two new ones. From the moment I hear the opening bars, I'm like, yep, yeah, I've got something for this. It's like just walking into a band. Mm. Um, and I think I dis and then again, working with Morgan Nichols on the band camp demos, Morgan would do that. He'd put an entire track together. So all I'd got to do was find the melody and the lyrics and the, and the sort of personality of the song. 
Um, and I think I enjoy that most uh, out of everything. Uh, I don't mind sitting and badly programming drums and badly playing the bass just to find a melody and a lyric. Um, but I think I prefer when they the, the songs almost come fully formed except for melodies yeah. and lyrics. So, so collaborating is, yeah, I love it. I love it. And you've got like a very distinctive sound. I mean, the one stuff I always have in my mind is extremely recognisable. And is there any sort of point where you think this isn't quite kind of our thing and do you but do you sort of pursue that anyway or how do you change things to make it more of a wonder stuff or or, or miles hunt record i think uh i think it's simply my voice you know yeah uh, when when uh mark gemini thwaite was sending me tracks he hadn't written them um for the wonder stuff he'd just written what he likes writing and after i'd worked on about four of them i'm like should we just call these wonder stuff songs and carry on working on an album and he's like yeah that, that's fine by me as long as people get to hear what we've done uh so i think my voice has a lot to do with it and then when we were working on the gemini thwaite songs in the studio for better being lucky the last album um we got malkin um even though the tracks didn't the, the gemini thwaite tracks didn't really need any more guitars but it was Malk that brings in his kind of signature wah-wah sound and the way Mike Malk plays chords in an open style and picks off an open B and E. Um, and then using Malk's backing vocals, it's, it's like, okay, these tracks now sound like mm. wonder stuff to me. But then strangely, the track I started work on last Monday, um, which I think I was, I think last week I was thinking, yeah, I'll just do a solo album. <laughs> but um but so i sent it to sent the track to luke johnson to liven up the drum program in and he came back within two minutes well being five minutes however long it took him to play the song after i sent it and he's is like dude this is like classic wonder stuff and i'm like is it i thought i thought i'd wrote something that didn't sound much like the wonder stuff at all and he's like you're kidding because it's got all the trademarks you know it, the way you jump from a verse to a chorus the way you throw a mid eight in the, the you know the, the way your voice rises in the chorus this is the wonder stuff and i'm like oh, okay uh, maybe it's a wonder stuff album then at, at this point in time it doesn't matter we just got to get some songs written i always ask my guests where it came from really in terms of like the the musicality or um, your first kind of exposure to music and wanting to do music. And do you have any kind of memories of, of that? Well, yeah. I mean, my dad was a jazz drummer um, before his kids came along and then he had to get a proper job. His brother was a keyboard player, is a keyboard player. My uncle Bill, he, um, I think probably around about 1969 or 1970, he joins a late lineup of the move. Uh, which then turned into, uh, it was when Roy Wood was there, and then Roy leaves the move and takes Bill with him, and they start the Electric Light Orchestra. Uh, I think they do two albums with the Electric Light Orchestra, and then uh, Roy changes his mind again or wants to go to the next development, and he forms Wizard, and he takes Uncle Bill with him there. Um, so there was a pop star in our family. You know, it, 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 did, it didn't seem like anything other than normal to us that uncle bill would be on top of the pops you know i was so <laughs> young so oh there's bill on the telly um so do we, and then one of the biggest bands in the uk at the time was slade and we loved them as kids and part of loving slade was because they were local because they had similar accents to us when you saw them interviewed or saw them on tv so that all felt very natural. So uh, me and my brother were hooked by then. And then, of course, punk rock comes along. I'm only 11 in 1977, but my brother and I would, had already started our record collections. And really, to us, the excitement of people like the Sex Pistols and the Ruts and the Clash and um, all those early punk bands, um, it just sounded like the most natural development from slade and sweet and you know it was rock the songs were coming in under three minutes it was exciting um so by the time i'm 11 or 12 the, the deal is is done there was there was really no no chance of me ever pursuing any other life path than than the one i've taken
what was the catalyst for choosing the drums first or did you start everything at more or less the same time in terms of that le- learning sort of yeah i mean my, my dad gave me drum lessons but they were you know proper drum lessons learning in a jazz style whereas i just wanted to belt the fucking things um, <laughs> yeah. so, uh, so i didn't pay that much attention to what my dad was teaching me um People, I, I, you know, it might just be as simple as something. Don Powell from Slade, not, not only is a phenomenal drummer, but we felt like we knew his character. Mm. You know, you know, chew, sitting there while he's drumming, he's chewing gum. He, to me, he was always the coolest member of Slade. Um, and my brother was definitely going to be a singer and a guitarist. Some, um, yeah. So I guess around about like seventy nine. Uh, I definitely thought, yeah, drums drums are for me. And by the early 80s, you had Joy Division and Echo and the Bunnymen, who had two extraordinary drummers. Maybe not technically brilliant, um, but for me, they were rewriting the book on what a, a drummer can do in a basic setup of a what is essentially a four-piece rock band. Um, but because these drummers were so stylistically unique, uh, Stephen Morris and Pete DeFratis, that was like another light going on for me. So, like, oh, okay, you don't just have to hold down a 4 4. You could, you know, something like Atrocity Exhibition by Joy Division. I can just, I, I, in fact, I would love just to have the solo drums to listen to. Uh, if that's enough for me, and then you got Pete DeFratis. Uh, what he was doing with Over the Wall and All My mm. Colors, Zimbo, they were they were game changers. Um, and once I spotted that, that was the kind of drumming I went after. Uh, went after. But then by 1986, I meet Martin Jilks, and I've decided to go over full time as, as a singer gu- rhythm guitarist. Martin Jilks was a had a unique style as well. He, he wasn't as tom tom heavy as I was as a drummer, but he he never. He never played just a straight 4-4 four, four beat. He'd, he'd put a swing in it. He did really curious things. Because I remember that first rehearsal going into it and Malk said, okay, come and try out as a singer. And I'm like, I wonder how I'm going to be playing with a drummer because my drumming mind will naturally go to sort of critique him what he's doing. Yeah. Um, but as soon as he started playing, I'm like, oh, this guy's this guy's in another league, you know. He's... I, I I would never come up with those beats. They're brilliant, you know. So that that was something really wonderful about the wonder stuff. My appreciation of what Martin did, yeah. And that transition from being at the back to being at the front and becoming a front man was that something you worked on, or did you already got sort of that uh, front man mentality in you, waiting, bursting to get out? <laughs> well, I, you know, I liked I liked front men. I, I, did, I, I was never that drawn towards people that sang in bands, particularly, you know, guys that with a rhythm guitar. You know, I loved Johnny Rotten. I, I loved the energy that Strummer had, Weller had. So, uh, so I, I, whatever I was going to try, it was going to be influenced by how intense those guys performed. Um. What was odd and still surprises me to this day was, you know, my factory settings again, as well as being bone idle, is um, I'm I'm shy. I was a painfully shy kid. Um, I was never the alpha male in any pack of friends that I had. I was anything but. In fact, I always used to, you know, Clint Mansell was my alpha male in my in my late teenage years. There was a guy called Dill at school that was a good fighter. You know, he was my alpha (laughs) male. I was never that guy. Um, so a certain amount of creation, uh, creativity had to go into, well, who am I going to be? Uh, who, who is the singer in the wonder, wonder stuff going to be? And certainly for the first, ooh, four or five years, it, it wasn't me. I mean, that, that was an act. That was, that was, uh, that was a character I invented that not only did the job of a mouthy, very confident front man, but also protected the shy real me, you know? Mm. And so as as the years went on, you developed this kind of less of a character and just grew into the role yourself and just became more confident with it. Well, there was an awkward transition period where I started to become 
the gobshite overconfident guy on stage <laughs> i've started to become him in in day-to-day -day activities um and then i think by the time i got to a about 1994, 1995, I, I shook that off. And I, I suppose what I am now is um, is an amalgamation of, of the two, really. I, th I think I am in real life like I am on stage. I, I don't have to strap on an assumed personality to go on stage anymore. It just feels like me now. In, in those early uh, negotiations with record companies, what was that like? Um, we were very lucky. We had two very competent managers uh, spotted us within, I think it was our second gig, the Wonder Stuff second gig. Yeah, it was. Um, and one of them was already working with um, major record companies. And he, he was, he'd helped out in some latter days of the beat, uh, had been more active with um, general public. Dave Wakelin and Rankin Rogers, other band. Um, and then the other manager of this partnership was a guy that um, was a very successful local promoter um, in the Midlands. And so he was working regularly with New Order, The Fall, you know, mostly sort of alternative bands. He's kind of, you know, his rule was he has to like the band. He wasn't a money guy. Mm. It was like, I want to promote bands that I love. And uh, so he was promoting at sort of 2,000 capacity rooms um, in the Midlands. So he could get us support slots on the big gigs. So they they knew all of those early things that a band has to learn um, that, that at the time we had no clue to do. So we were blessed. So it was Les Johnson, who is the father of Luke Johnson, who is the drummer that I'm talking about that lives out in Arizona that does the drum program and co-writing with me. Um, so Les Johnson and then a guy called David Aldridge was the sort of uh, the more record company guy and they were they they didn't hide anything from us they that you know, all the negotiations and things and people that they were meeting they told us why they would tell us how the meetings have gone um, so as far as being getting attention from major record companies it all happened within the first 10 to 12 months of us even forming. And uh, it, we didn't have our eye set on that prize, to be honest. We we wanted to have our own little indie label, and that's that's really as far as we saw it. But then we were getting a lot of attention from basically all of the London-based major record companies, um, which Dave and Les were sort of fielding. Um so it was very very easy really I and mean, it seemed to all get very serious in sort of november december 1987 um and which when we actually the band members took meetings with uh with a and r guys and heads of departments and things and then in the december of 87 we signed to polydor having having met other labels and and you know the, the, dave and les were steering us towards polydor um, because there was a particularly great A and R man there that had been working at Warner Brothers um, and working with Alan McGee on a label that uh, that the two of them had set up via Warner's called Elevation, which I think had done the first Primal Scream album, uh, quite possibly had done the Weather Prophets single, maybe an album. Um, but this guy was called Graham Carpenter, and he'd gone to Polydor, um, and we, we just felt like we were in very very safe hands and for all of my period with polydor which was was actually just, just short of 10 years um I, I always felt like i was in very safe hands yeah yeah they were they were great i absolutely i mean we had our ups and downs mm. um but i i think it was my first acoustic tour of america in 98 with malk trees and i'm standing on stage in chicago and there's a, a, a full room of 600 people that have come to see me and Malk do our very first acoustic show. This is, I'm, we'd been dropped by Polydor then. Mm. And I, I think it was then that I thought, okay, well, <laughs> I didn't get these people here. Um, this was Polydor. This, even the American branches of Polydor that, that, that did great for us. I mean, again, I would complain a lot at the time. But by the end of the 90s, when I was no longer with Polydor, I'm like, well, 
all these people know our music because Polydor did such a good job with us. So I, I remain ever grateful to. Yeah, it was, a, it was a nice and easy transition. We were blessed. And uh, the America experience for you was it? As I mean, lots of artists say that it's it's, it's quite um, full on to say the least. I mean, was it the same for you? Yeah, it, it, it was that. That's the one shame. We got a lot of things wrong, really. Um, that first tour that we did, we were spending a little bit of time with a, a Beverly Hills based manager um, who'd got a couple, I think maybe even just one other band at that time, American band called Drama Rama. So he, he'd been a promoter and wanted to get into management. Um, and we liked him a lot. And, you know, these decisions are really hard to make and, unless you want to be a real, you know, hard nut about it and just go, well, show me your successes. We we weren't really like that. We were always personality driven. Mm -hmm. um, and so our American manager was a guy called Steve Rennie, who uh, I'm still friends with. He went on to have huge success with Incubus. Um, I think he's pretty much semi-retired now. But um, he was just, he was funny. That's why we liked him. He, he, the guy was funny. Um, he, he'd he never met people from the black country in the Midlands. <laughs> Beverly Hills born and bred, you know. So mm. it was a learning curve for him. Uh, and particularly because we didn't have our eye on the prize. Uh, definitely the other band he was working with had a very American very American sensibilities about what they were doing. I mean, they were very serious about their songwriting and their performances, but they wanted success, you know, they, and, and rightfully so. They were a good band. Um, we weren't like that. We, we, were, we wanted to enjoy ourselves. And as soon as we were taken out of our com comfort zones and put on American radio station gigs supporting, you know, people like Susie and the Banshees and huge bands as far as we were concerned, mm. um, and those big American venues that are union run and you're not allowed to even walk on stage and get your guitar and, you know, because it's, uh, you might be going out of tune because somebody opened a door and let the cold air in, you're not allowed. And it's just, <laughs> it just, we didn't come from a world of rules and regulations. Um, it wasn't like that. And, and, and the British radio set up, um, so we knew how to go into Radio 1 and talk to Janice Long and talk to Mark Goodyear. Um, but we didn't know how to talk to, and, we, and, you know, there's a radio station every five mile that you drive in the States. Some of them are really influential. Um, so we, 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 were, we, were, we were clueless. And um, the, the American manager tried his best to explain to us what was going on. But most of the time, we just felt completely out of our depth. Um, um, but that kind of made us attractive to certain journalists and, and radio types that we were a bit unruly and... Um, <laughs> Uh, and maybe American rock and roll scene needed that kick up, that specific kick up the arse. So we did meet some great people at radio and, and promotions people that I'm still very happy to say I'm friend. I think about them a lot. I talk to them occasionally and particularly last year why everyone was locked indoors. Um, but yeah, it was a learning curve. Um, but I, I think I've probably got to say that my, my favorite period of being in America would be from sort of 98 to 2003 when I was working with a, a New Jersey indie label called Gig Records and I'm out there doing acoustic tours, occasionally band tours, uh, but mostly acoustic tours and I'm, I'm driving, you know, it's seven or eight weeks of driving in cars or vans and, uh, you know, there's no agent booking hotels for you and I loved it. I mm. absolutely, you know, at, from going from the wheel of the van into a hotel, got any rooms, then off to the venue uh, it, and selling your own merch and getting on the road at one o'clock in the morning and just starting it all over again. It, it felt, I suppose, quite romantic. It was a lot of fun. So, um, and not having to nip into radio stations all the time and repeat yourself every day. So. You just do it. Uh, you're just doing on podcasts now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I think that five years of working with gig records is, is the best time I had in America because it was any any 24 hours, anything could happen. You know, really yeah. happy memories of that. Before I let you go, um, I was going <laughs> to ask a little bit about the, the book, uh, the fan book, God Bless the Fucking Knot of Us. <laughs> yeah. 
What, where, what's the concept of this book and where, you know, what's the plan? Well, it, ca- it came, unsurprisingly, from a fan, um, a guy called uh, Jim Swindles that I've got to know over the years. Uh, he'd seen, may- and maybe it was Simple Minds had done something like this. So um, audience members uh, write their stories and anecdotes about uh, either, you know, meeting the band, hanging out with the band or just moments in their lives could have been their university or school years could have been meeting the love of their lives and what certain songs or you know bands like us when we started gigging in the late 80s you'd have you know loads of kids on the motorways (laughs) thumbing lifts and some of them we would pick up and stick them in the tour bus you know yeah yeah um and so write their stories uh that are wonder stuff connected and uh, if at all possible, photographs of themselves from around that period. Uh, and then uh, our designer, Phil Birchall, is going to compile the, all of that into a nice coffee table book. I've seen some of the entries. They're great. They're very funny. Some are very sentimental. And, yeah, it's nice. It's coming along nicely. So uh, Phil's just got to get all of them together. He has a number of how many he's got to get. So um, mm. that's coming along. And then I'm writing another book. Uh, which is um, it's, it's it's not called Song by Song. We haven't got a title for it yet, but it's basically me and a, a dear old friend of mine that I've known since I was 15 called Brian Taylor talking about every single song in chronological order that the Wonder Stuff have ever recorded and released. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. And so we get on a Zoom and I re- we, we do it an hour at a time. And so Brian's done all his research and he tells, you know, he's got all these questions logged away that he's like, well, where did that lyric come and who came up with that bit of the song and where did you record it and what are your thoughts about it now? Um, and, and I write it up in a very conversational way, you know, if like one of us is pissing ourselves laughing, I write the laugh in. And so it just goes, you know, BT, Brian Taylor, and then NMH, and then whatever I've got to say. But that's that's really nice. But we've done maybe 10 Zoom calls at this point. So we've done 10 hours on it already, and we're only halfway through the second album. <laughs> oh, Christ. So it's, <laughs> it's quite the undertaking. I didn't realize it quite what an undertaking but you know i got no, not that much else to do so and i always enjoyed my conversations with brian and you're, you're well uh, rehearsed in zoom conversations these days as well yeah 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 they've become <laughs> quite natural in fact i i encourage it even with my friends I've, I've got so used to having my hands free and not holding a phone to my head i prefer this yeah yeah well miles it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you thank you so much for for talking about the wonder stuff and everything else that's that, that you've been up to um really appreciate it you're very welcome. Thank you. Thanks again to Miles for joining me on the podcast. It was an absolute pleasure to speak to him about everything he's been doing and uh, all the future projects he's got coming up. I'd just like to say a massive thank you to everybody who's been supporting the podcast. And there's loads of ways you can do that. There's social media. So just search for Back to Britpop on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. And as I'm sure you're aware, I do this all off my own back without any financial support. So I'm not part of a network don't have advertising and they don't have a sponsor so any financial support you can provide is greatly appreciated just to help pay for the distribution and the running and the producing of the podcast on its own so there's a link to like a coffee or ko-fi page i'll never really know how to pronounce that in the show notes if you click that you can do a donation buy me a virtual coffee and thank you to everybody who's done that so far it's amazing The other thing that really helps is to go to Apple Podcasts, the app or on desktop and leave a five star rating and a short review if you have time. So that's enough waffle from me. And I apologize for keep bombarding you with this information every episode. I'll be back next week, fingers crossed, with another episode. So in the meantime, take care. (laughs) 